Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we dig into God's Word. We really actually just dwell richly in the Word that God has given us, and I'm glad that you are here. Today, we are continuing on in our study through Ephesians. We're in Lesson 1. This is Day 8 of Lesson 1, which moves us through the second half of Chapter 1. We've spent three days circling through this first half of a beautiful opening song and prayer, uh, this portion of verse 1, and now we're moving on to the second portion. So it's truly been a deep dive into these first few verses. And uh, so I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Let's go ahead and get into the word and uh, start our study. We're going to go ahead and do that with prayer. And as I'm praying, I want to also invite you to make sure that you have got the lesson downloaded off of our um, La Mirada Church website. Go to lamoradachurch.com. Make sure you've downloaded the lesson. Of course, I know some of you have the print copy because you're able to join us live in person on Mondays or Tuesdays for our Bible study at church, but maybe you are traveling or maybe you're not able to join us in person, you can access those lessons for free anytime online through um, uh, our website. Go to lamradachurch.com, women's ministry, go over to the Bible study page, click, drop, there you go, you'll see it, Ephesians. All right, um, and then what was the other thing? Oh, if you're watching me right now on YouTube, hit that subscribe button today and subscribe so that you can get notified when we post a new video. And then hit, there's a little alarm button that you can click also, click that, and that'll give you those notifications. Give us a like, that really helps us out as well. Yay! And then those of you who are just listening to the audio of this on our podcast through Dwelling Richly Podcast, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. Drop a comment today, ask a question, and uh, just be part of that community there. There's several ways for us to connect including our LMCC Women's Facebook page, which we normally are able to go live and do this Bible study. But today, um, there was a technical issue with the way that our Zoom host was connecting to Facebook. I will resolve that later, and hopefully we'll be back streaming live on Facebook in the next video. But for today, you just get a good old-fashioned recording of my face doing Bible study. So, all right. Well, let's go ahead and pray and dig into the study today. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with a lot on our mind and our heart. There's so many things that we can bring to the table and bring to our study. And so we want to just rest in you, uh, look to you, lay those burdens down, and just be able to come to the word today um, with our mind and our heart, ready to hear what you have for us today. Uh, help us, Lord, to do that. And I ask a blessing on those who are listening and ask that you will give them clarity of thought peace in their heart and um, strength to face the day and what, what happens um, throughout their day today. Lord, we thank you for your love for us once again and the power of your word in our, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do this. I'm going to switch the screen over real quick here and share the lesson. There we go my face up and over out of the corner there all right so here we are lesson one day eight and as always we begin by writing our memory verse which this week comes from ephesians 1 verse 3 we're going to do that in just a second um, right now i'm going to hop over to our scripture reading for the day which is ephesians 1 15 through 23 so we'll do a little bit of both we're going to go ahead over here to um a bible gateway and open up that scripture. I have it set right now to the new international version because that's what I was reading out of yesterday. But for the sake of this study, we we use the English Standard Version, not because it's better per se, it's just um, consistency, you know, being able to say we're all going to use this particular version as we move through the study. But if you can see in the video, I've got my ESV Bible here. I've got, what have I got over here? my life application. I think that's the NLT. Something like that. Oh, no, that's, yeah, that's the NLT. Anyway, point being, use the Bible that's comfortable for you, but know that sometimes the way that the questions are worded are going to be oriented toward the wording that's in the English Standard Version. That's all. All right. I know I've just lost track. Where are we going? 15 to 23. All right, which is the, sec which is the remainder of the passage. So our memory verse, again, is 1 through 3. I mean, verse 3. <laughs> 1 through 3. Um, let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll jump down to verse 15 and start our reading for the day. So here's our memory verse for the week. How are you doing on it? You got it memorized? I think I'm pretty close. I usually have to glance at it, but it's not that hard. 
you're practicing and you're getting your writing done each week, hopefully that's going well for you. Let's go ahead and say it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How you doing? Good? All right. <laughs> I hope so. All right. Well, let's go ahead on and read to the end of this chapter. For this reason. Now, we've spent three days on this reason. So if you are just now jumping into the study, if you are just now jumping into the study, make sure you know the reason. <laughs> Don't just jump in on verse 15. And anytime you are reading in the scripture, make sure that you are, uh, you know, when a, a section of scripture starts off like that with that kind of phrase, you know what you're going back to. Anyway, let's go back to the reading. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. All right, good stuff. Let's go ahead and continue on. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, this is another grand long sentence, a prayer actually, so we'll take the next two days to cover it for this reason. So what was the reason that Paul was referring to? Well, he had talked all the way through at the very beginning about their saving faith. They had faith, all right? Remember, to the saints who were faithful. And then he goes into all this about God. But if you go all the way back to the beginning, we see that they are faithful to the saints in Ephesus who are faithful. And then this whole next passage from 3 to 14 has been about God and choosing us and hearing the gospel and us, resp uh, us responding to it, right? And so for this reason, the greatness of God, the spiritual blessings that we have, namely that they have been faithful. All right. Um, where did I say? Where is this? The word is, this word is, what is Paul referring to for this reason? Oh, their faithfulness. Okay. Sorry, mumbling to myself there. So review this portion. This is important. Where was Paul when he wrote this epistle? Remember going back through your whole read through it, the very first lesson, uh, day of this lesson. We read through the entire book of Ephesians. I had you take notes to that. So hopefully you're remembering off the top of your head. What is it? Say it. I feel like I'm in Dora the Explorer. What is the answer? Good job. Prison. All right. So he's in prison. Based on what we've read about Paul's experiences with the Ephesians, we read this in Acts 19 and 20, again, back in the intro to the entire lesson. How is that that he had heard of their faith and love? Wouldn't he have seen it firsthand? Think about it. I've heard of your faith. He doesn't say he's seen it firsthand. He's heard of it. What do you think he's referring to in this passage? passage? Let's go ahead and review Acts 28.20. 20. Acts 28.20. 20. And again, if you are using the online study, it's pretty cool because you could just click through like this. And I've opened this up in multiple um, versions for us. And we're going to look at Acts um, 28, verse 20, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. For this reason, there's another one of those. Therefore, I have asked to, um, see, to see you and speak with you since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain, All right? So he's in, he's in prison. He's wearing this chain, he says. And um, 
what do you think he's referring to in this passage? Well, he's been wearing these chains, and you can continue reading on the rest of this passage here. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that at everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers from morning till evening. He expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. So, Again, I'm trying to help you pull it all together here in our study, but we've talked about that the Ephesians were Gentiles. Um, they had heard and they did respond, and that Paul is writing to them, um, having heard of their faith, about having, they, they were the, among the people who did respond, unlike some of the Jews that he um, preached to who did not respond. Paul is assured of their believing, saving faith, but his prayer says he wants more than just salvation for them. What does he say that he's doing for them. How does Paul describe God? List all the things that Paul says that the Father of glory would give these saints. Well, what does he say that he's doing for them? Well, he's praying for them. He says, um, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he gives thanks for them. And how does he describe God? God, the Father of um, where is this? God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. So list all the things then that he prays that the Father of glory would give these saints. Well, he says that he wants them to have a spirit of wisdom and of the revelation of the knowledge of him. So not only um, what to do with the knowledge, but to have, have the knowledge and then the wisdom about the knowledge of him. That the eyes of their heart, the the, the emotional seat of who they are, their, their true being really actually is what the heart means in this passage. The eyes of their heart is enlightened. And to know what the hope is that he has called you and the riches of the glories, uh, uh, inheritance that they have and the immeasurable greatness of his power. You can just kind of read through and see all of those different things that Paul says, this is what I want you to know. I want you to understand, have the spirit of wisdom, of revelation of the knowledge of him, that your eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and the immeasurable greatness of his power. What will happen then as a result of having the eyes of our hearts enlightened? Well, it says in verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope for which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the work of his great might. So basically those three things. And what are the three what's that Paul wants them to know? The what is the hope, the riches, and the power. Again, going back to verse 18 on that, that you may know what is the hope, what is, are the riches, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power, of his power, and then the greatness of his power as well. And then moving on to number seven, from Ephesians 1, 19 through 20, what is too powerful for God? Anything? How does Paul describe God's power in these verses? So let's take a look at verses 19 and 20. What is, he wants them to know what is the immeasurable greatness of the power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might and that, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Scooting on, hold on here. So consider Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, and the entire universe came into being at the power of God's word. What does Paul name as evidence of God's immeasurable and great, immeasurable and great power in verse, uh, in 120? Well, let's take a look. That he worked in Christ, this immeasurable great power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand 
All right. So that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work where? Where do we see that, that kind of power, the power that can restore Jesus from the dead? I mean, God, we, we know that God created the whole universe, but the power that Paul is talking about is even greater than the power of the creation of the universe, really. He's saying he, Christ was raised from the dead. That's the power. And so that power is at work where? He said that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over the church, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness who fills all in all, all of that power there. He wants to know that same power who or or where is that same power at work? It's in those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, um, first, that the God of Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, may give you spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of the power toward us who believe, those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what he wants to, to know that we have that kind of power working in us. So think about that truth. The same power required to live a life pleasing to God is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The power is at work in those who are in Christ. How do you think a life characterized by that kind of life would look? And I've given you a link here if you're interested in looking that up and digging a little more. But go ahead and write out your thoughts to that first. And then um, read this interesting article I found. And I think you'll be blessed as well. I'm going to kind of... I kind of want to go over and look at it right now with you, but I really want you to take the time. So pause if you're listening. I want you to work on this on your own. Write that out. What does that look like? How do you think a life characterized by that kind of power would actually look? Come up with four or five thoughts and bullet points on that. And I'm going to, while you're doing that, pause and then come back in a second. I'm going to open up this article. Great resource, Bible.org. All right. So those who become Christians by faith in Christ soon discover that being born again does not automatically solve all of their spiritual problems. Satan, who has done everything he can to keep a person from becoming a Christian, now changes his tactics to keep a Christian from achieving a real testimony for Christ. The Christian is faced with a world system that is contrary to serving the Lord. The world's standards, its values, its immorality, and its materialism constitute a formidable op opposition to a Christian who wants to serve the Lord effectively. Satan will also do all he can to keep a Christian from fulfilling God's plan for his life. Christians accordingly are exhorted to be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not going to read the entire article to you, <laughs> but I want you to read it. It's a really good one. And it really kind of nails this down. But I hope that you've had a chance to reflect on your own thoughts about this and what it looks like to live under that kind of power. Then I'd like you to come back, read the thoughts expressed in this article here. And I um, borrowed some of the closing thoughts from this article for our closing as well in our study. So let me go ahead and switch back over to that. This is a great way to visual, and I really appreciated the way the author of that article pulled that together. So I'm going to close with that thought as well, and then let you go back and read that on your own and uh, come back to study and write, your, write more thoughts and be ready to share them, of course, in just a couple of days when we get back to our, our study. But let me go ahead and, hello, get a little bit larger here so we can see each other a little better. So in conclusion, in a way, flying on an airplane is like our walk with Christ. We can zoom across the nation, across the sea, go anywhere in just a few hours because of the power of an airplane. Here's the deal, though. We have to trust the plane enough to get on board and let it carry us. In the same way, living in the power of God can enable us to truly live a life astounded, to truly live, <laughs> to live a truly astounding life, even in the face of incredible trial and stress. How can we really live in joy, victory, obedience, and commitment if we're not relying upon the power of the spirit that we have in Christ? Does it thrill you to think that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you? It doesn't always thrill me, just being honest. I know I have that power, but I don't continuously live with the truth of that power present in my mind. I'm too often stumbling in my sin, living in weakness, tripped up by my selfish thought life. 
and said, I want to not just know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. I want to step aboard and let it enable me to fly, to soar in his power above all rule and authority and power and dominion. What a great reminder for me, for all of us today. So once again, I encourage you to go back through and really think about what your life will look like if it was empowered really, truly, uh, with the, the truth um, of the greatness of the power of, that raised Christ from the dead. That's the power that's at work within me today. And like I said in the closing, it's something that I think we just kind of go about our life as Christians and we see ourselves as just everybody else. We're just different because we believe in Jesus. We're just different because we're going to heaven someday. And I know for me, I, I lose sight of that power that's at work in me. So my prayer for all of us today is that we would live in that power. We would be constantly aware of it. We would be thinking along those lines that we have that power at work in us. And what does that look like? I believe the remainder of our study through Ephesians is going to give us more clarity on that. All right. Well, thank you for being here with us today. And don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening and joining in from. And as always, I appreciate comments that you leave. It makes it, um, makes it more engaging for the whole community to connect. So write a comment. Um, leave a leave a question, anything you'd like to say, and um, let's let's kind of be more of a community engage with us, us that way. If you're enjoying this study, be sure to share it with your friends and let other people know that they can join us live um, and in person if they come on Monday or Tuesday, or they can just join in on our discussion when we go through these generally live on Facebook, but sometimes because of technology, not so live. All right, God bless you. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow morning. Bye bye for now.